and I'm gonna, I, I got it taken care of. No worries. You got it covered? Yep. All right, Dr. Malcolm, it's six o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put everybody on mute, and uh, I'll let you provide the introduction and then explain kind of how we're going to how we're going to manage this, and I'll take care of the chat room and let you take care of your presentation. All right, that sounds good, Jesse. I appreciate it. It's great seeing oh, a bunch of familiar. You. And I'll unmute myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess for starters, you know, just acknowledging what an unusual time it is right now for all of us, I'm sure, on the personal front and the professional front, and, uh, you know, the idea of coming to you virtually from my, my bedroom loft office here to talk about moose hunting and moose conservation is a little bit, a little bit strange and maybe a little awkward, uh, but I really appreciate the invitation, and I appreciate all of you taking some time to join me and uh, thanks for getting a glimpse into your own respective personal dwellings and whatnot. So thanks for making a little bit of time to be here this evening. Um, we are going to get into some of the science about moose conservation, moose management. And for those of you who are interested with the idea of exploring the possibility of hunting moose in the lower 48, give you some uh, ideas on like tips and techniques and strategies for First of all, getting a tag, and then what to do if you're lucky enough to get a tag. Um, so we'll get into some of those specifics. In terms of the presentation today, this is going to be super informal, which is why I've chosen not to shave for five days and why I'm wearing a baseball cap. So I welcome you to uh, raise your hand or uh, just speak up. You know, there's a chat box. Let me know. Let Jesse know if you want to interject into the conversation. Um, we can handle questions on the fly, or if you want to note them down, we can we can have a little Q and A session at the end. But uh, if you're having any issues with the technology, feel free to just start waving your hands frantically at the camera, and that will be a signal too that we can get you unmuted. But obviously, the point here is to have a good time, to be laid back. Um, so don't worry about. Uh, you know, interrupting if you've got a, a burning question along the line here. So chat box for folks who are not super versed in uh, team, I guess not teams, we're in Zoom now. Teams is what we're using in work all the time. Uh, but if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to access the chat box and you can type comments in there. And I think there are uh, two options. You can either clap or give me a thumbs up, which are both affirmative and make me feel good about myself. So feel free to give thumbs up or claps anywhere along the way. Daryl, that goes for you too, man. Oh, Lou, see? Lou Carpenter, give me a thumbs up right off the bat, man. Love it. You're also likely to hear barking dogs and screaming children in the background here at my house. So just roll with those punches. Um, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth among several different screens that I'll be sharing here. There's my, my bird dog saying hi. Uh, Ray Trejo, that's one of those large Munster landers that I know you envy. Um, so you're gonna have to bear with me while I switch between various screens. Um, and for starters here, let me just see, like give me a visual thumbs up if you're seeing the cover slide for my presentation. Everybody's got that once in a lifetime. Thanks, perfect, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and dive in. And the first thing I have the very wonderful privilege of doing on this presentation, wait for it, slide loading. I get to share with you this beautiful photo. Um, and I, I have the honor, the privilege on behalf of the New Mexico Wildlife Federation to uh, congratulate Rosemary Waller, who took the winning photo 
uh, for the LWCF photo contest. And Rosemary's picture here, as you can see, is from atop the Oregon Mountains in Las Cruces. So on top of the needle, the highest point of the Oregon Mountains. So Rosemary Waller is the winner of the LWCF photo contest. And the prize for that is uh, nothing to scoff at. Rosemary is gonna be receiving a Vortex 20 to 60 power uh, with an 80 millimeter objective angled spotting scope and phone scope adap adapter kit for her winning photo. And uh, in addition to getting to share that great news about Rosemary's victorious and beautiful picture, if you hang out for the course of the presentation, I will also be announcing the next uh, iteration of a nature-based friendly competition with awesome prizes through the New Mexico Wildlife Federation. So I'll share those details at the end. But congratulations, Rosemary, beautiful shot. All right, so I'm gonna start off by just giving you some basic biology on moose in North America. Um, we have four different subspecies of moose. I'm gonna be focusing predominantly today on the Shiras subspecies, which is the farthest southern extending of the four subspecies. There's also the Alaskan moose up in Alaska and the Yukon, uh, the Northwestern uh, subspecies, the Eastern subspecies, which is what we have over in the Great Lakes states. And it's also the Eastern moose that was translocated to Newfoundland. So that's the subspecies that they have out there where it's, they've got pretty robust populations, but notably not a, uh, not a native species to that island. But we're gonna be focusing predominantly on the Shiras moose. Um, there are a number of states here in the lower 48 that have sufficiently robust populations of Shiras moose to include a hunting season. And there's a really great report um, that I wanna give credit to that was published in 2017 by a collection of state agency biologists who span all of the states where Shiras moose uh, are, are inhabitants. And the, the real core of the Shiras moose range where you have huntable populations are these six states of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and then up in Northeastern Washington state, there's a huntable population there as well. And uh, Brandon, it's good to see you maintaining that face mask for social distancing for all the people there at your screen. Good to see you, man. Thanks for joining. So those six states are the bulk of the, uh, the population. They're also little fringes of Shiras moose habitat in Nevada and Oregon, but no hunting opportunity in those states. And as you can see, based on the range map, the real heart of the Shiras moose range is Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. And in Colorado, they've got really um, relatively new and expanding populations there. And we'll talk about some of the population trend data for Shiras moose. And it's worth noting that in places where they're relatively new on the landscape, they're actually doing uh, more robustly, which is not unusual for uh, populations that are moving into new areas. Oftentimes you see an initial eruption in numbers. So we'll get into some of those details, but to give you an idea of the amount of uh, hunting opportunity available, again, in those six states, and these are 2015 data, but they're pretty similar to uh, current. I pulled them from, again, this great report that we've got linked here but about 2,300 tags across those six states and about 1,800 moose being harvested. So one of the takeaways here is that there aren't a heck of a lot of tags when you think about that uh, spanning six different states. And then another key takeaway would be if you're fortunate enough to pull one of those tags, your chances of getting a moose are pretty darn high uh, in, the, in the ballpark of about an 80% success rate across all those different moose hunting units. Okay, moving on and looking at state-by-state state data. Um, this nice table here gives you an idea of which states have the most permits. Um, so in that first column there, I'd point out that Idaho, uh, as of recent years at least, has the most tags available of any of the states with Shiras moose, um, also the highest harvest. And then if you look at different states uh, having different strategies for population management, it's interesting to note that states range from 0% cow hunts or antlerless hunts in Utah, all the way up to in Colorado, almost 50% of the hunt being cow or calf tags for moose. Again, in terms of hunter success among the antlered hunts, very high, <clears throat> ranging from 
the low 70% up to the mid 90%. And in terms of uh, hunter success for antlerless, antlerless slightly lower. Um, one of the driving factors for that is relatively low uh, hunter investment in, in cow and calf hunts versus bull hunts. The folks that draw those bull tags uh, tend to be very motivated. And the hunt that I had was for uh, a bull moose in Idaho and it was a once in a lifetime tag. So for those of you in New Mexico, that, that idea of once in a lifetime hunts is nothing new. You know, if you draw the White Sands Missile Range Oryx hunt or the Via Vidal elk hunt or a bighorn sheep tag, the list goes on. You can never apply again. And that's the case for uh, a bull moose tag in Idaho. So I'm out of the game in Idaho. I'm one less non-resident with whom you would need to compete for those precious tags. So moving on, I wanna show you uh, the distribution of uh, units where populations are increasing, decreasing, or stable for Shiris moose. So my hunt was up in the panhandle of Idaho and those tags that are uh, in the lighter shade of blue where there's uh, an increasing trend in moose population. But you can note that in a, a vast portion of the state of Idaho and elsewhere, you see those tags um, that are listed in either red, orange, or kind of that peach color. Those are all units where hunting opportunity has been declining in recent history. Um, and then again, looking at places like Northern Montana, Colorado, and Northeastern Washington, you can see places where there's a relatively uh, robust increase in hunting opportunity or even new units coming online. So that's the color-coded map. And then if you look over at the shaded map, you've got a, an idea of density of permits on the landscape. And again, that area I was hunting up in Idaho is one of the dark shaded areas where there's a relatively high population density, which corresponds to a relatively high density of hunting opportunity. So all that's gonna play into your mindset depending on what you're looking for um, in terms of getting a moose tag. And in my mind, you know, I, the idea of being able to hunt Shiris moose in the lower 48, it always seemed like it was kind of out of reach just in terms of the drawing odds being in my mind almost unapproachable you know I've applied for bighorn sheep every year never had a bighorn sheep tag the list goes on but I started doing research and realized if you're really looking for an opportunity hunt and you just want to be able to get a moose license and you're not trying to target the really premier you know like shoot a record book kind of bull units the odds of drawing some of these non-resident tags are actually very approachable. And I'll get into some of the details about why exactly that is. But one of the key things is, again, up in that Idaho panhandle country, for example, a very high density of animals on the landscape, increasing hunting opportunity, and a very high uh, tag quota per unit of space compared to other parts of the country. All right, so what have these moose populations been doing in the core six states that have hunting opportunity in recent history? Well, the, the kind of overall answer is that the moose numbers have been on the decline. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the specifics driving these declines. But if you look particularly at uh, the example of Wyoming, they historically had the most robust moose numbers and they were, they were harvesting up around 1200 moose per year um, around, around the year 2000. And you can see there's been a precipitous decline in the state of Wyoming. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, some of these states that started off with relatively low populations have been steadily climbing. So Washington and Colorado notably have been on the climb. And again, those are, those are relatively new populations on the landscape, places where moose have uh, patriated new habitat and are, are doing really well. There's, there's high uh, twinning numbers among the among the cows and uh, survivorship over winter tends to be pretty good less issues with some of the parasites etc but um, I'll again draw your attention to Idaho a state where there has been very high opportunity and relatively stable in recent history in terms of the populations and of course when it comes to the tag quotas it's important to bear in mind the game and fish agencies state by state are looking at a host of factors and obviously one of the constraints on population growth is gonna be that hunting pressure, but it's not the case that uh, 
the managed hunting is what's driving these declines. There's a host of other factors, and I'll talk about those here momentarily. So this, uh, this table here corresponds to uh, the number of units in each of these states, and it shows you for each of those units, um, are moose permits in the unit stable, increasing, or decreasing? And again, this is similar to the data we saw in the last slide, but I'd point out in Colorado, for example, they have a massive number of their game management units with increasing uh, uh, hunting opportunity. And in places like Wyoming at the other end of the spectrum, they have a number where hunting opportunity is decreasing. And uh, with Idaho, where I was, you've got a, a lot of the units that have lost hunting opportunity, units up in the panhandle tend to be doing pretty well. Okay, so what's driving these declines? There's a whole host of factors that uh, the wildlife managers across these eight different states have looked at as potential uh, drivers of, of change in density on the landscape. And so this table, you've got a number of the scientific names of these different parasites and diseases. Some of them are really familiar, things like chronic wasting disease. And you can see some states have CWD issues and we have had confirmed cases of CWD in moose. So states like Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming all have CWD on the landscape. Um, and these, these different symbols, so your pluses mean that we know it's, it's present. Two pluses mean it's present and it's really common in areas where the moose are also on the landscape. So as you, as you survey this table, look for those things that are double pluses. And those are some of the explanatory variables that the state wildlife biologists are pointing to as likely drivers of decline. So things like these parasites, different arter arterial worms, ticks, tapeworms, liver flukes, and then notably this, this brain worm, which is a big deal out east, Paralophostrangillus tenius, is the brain worm that um, infects the central nervous system of, of moose in particular, and that's a big deal for eastern moose in places like Maine. Um, but notably, in Shiris moose country, this is a non-issue. We have no documented cases of the brain worm here in the west. Um, but you can see there's a whole host of these other potential um, risk factors when it comes to productivity of the moose population. And then of course, we've got predators on the landscape too. So black bears are a big deal throughout moose habitat in all these states. Same with mountain lions. A number of states, Idaho, Montana, Washington, Wyoming have robust and in, and in some cases increasing wolf populations. And then of course, a handful of these states also have grizzly bears which will specialize on moose calves um, when the season is right. So a whole host of factors here. And then on top of that, throughout a lot of moose habitat, you know, one of the limiting factors for moose is uh, warm weather. And so as we have climate change impacting moose habitat and compromising fitness, that heat stress in the summertime is a big deal for moose as well. And one of the things to bear in mind, you'd say, so looking at that map, right, in Colorado, which is among the southernmost Shiris moose habitat, the populations are doing really well. So why would it be that at those lower latitudes, if I'm saying climate change is a big deal, why is Colorado doing well? There's a couple of things to bear in mind. First of all, um, the moose in Colorado are existing at high elevation. So elevation, of course, can compensate for latitude. So when you're thinking about moving south, we're also moving up in elevation where we have moose habitat in a place like Colorado. And the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, those moose in Colorado are starting to move into new areas where there's very little competition for resources, for forage. They're at very low density. And in those situations, ungulates oftentimes will exhibit very rapid population growth compared to populations elsewhere where they've been on the landscape for a long time. So it's that founder uh, eruption effect that's occurring in, in some of those new places where the, where the populations haven't been on the landscape for a long time. So a lot of complex variables. There's no one answer for why moose would be declining or increasing in any one place, but this is a, a picture for you of the, 
the set of likely culprits, if you will. So I want to talk a little bit about draw odds and harvest statistics. And I, uh, I'd just be interested, I can't see everybody's screen, but if you could give me like a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a thumbs somewhere in the middle for how you're feeling about your draw results in your home state this year. I'd be keen on seeing that. So I'm seeing some thumbs ups. I'm seeing down from Brandon. Sorry, man. How about you, Trejo? Thumbs up. Raise, raise the thumbs down for Ray. Well, you got, you got quail hunting, man. There's always quail hunting to be had. I feel you. All right. So if you guys are like me, and by guys, I mean guys and gals. You guys and gals are like me. Um, I spend way too much time looking at spreadsheets of prior year draw odds and success rates and all the hunting harvest stats and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm feeling like very satisfied and happy about the draw results this year. I actually pulled a couple decent tags I'm excited about. Um, but I did my homework is the point I'm trying to make here. And sometimes I feel like even when you do your homework, it doesn't necessarily pan out. Um, but any of these states with Shirus moose populations, they spend a lot of time and a lot of money um, trying to gather useful information to manage moose. It's also very useful information for people who want to be able to hunt a moose. And if you're not taking the time to study those resources, you're missing the mark. That's also true here in New Mexico. So I hope for folks that are, you know, New Mexico residents and, and maybe not super happy with how the draw went this year, and you're not pouring over those spreadsheets, that's the golden ticket. So what I wanna do is show you um, some of the data resources that Idaho, as an example, makes available. But I've also looked at all the other five states that have Shirus moose hunting opportunity, and every single state provides similar information. So I'm gonna switch over screens here and bring up a different, uh, a different document. So first we're gonna look at uh, drawing odds for the state of Idaho. All right, I have three monitors going here, so you just gotta bear with me for a moment. All right, can I get a thumbs up if people see the Idaho Game and Fish website? Okay, sweet. So what we have here, these are 2019 data. And if you just go to Google, and if you were to type in Idaho Fish and Game Moose Draw Odds, it will take you to this website. So you can type in your species, select the year, and the drawing piece for this species is sort of irrelevant because if you draw, it's gonna be your first choice. So. I'm just going to walk through this a little bit because maybe not everybody has seen this kind of information represented in this way. So if you're an old hand at this, I apologize. But this table shows you all these different hunt codes, different game management units. It shows you the number of permits available, the number of people who applied, and the number of people who drew tags, and then a percentage of the people who were successful in the draw. And one of the things that is really cool about Idaho when it comes to trying to get a moose tag is that unlike other states, if you wanna hunt for moose or bighorn sheep or mountain goat, which are like the premier once in a lifetime species in Idaho, in any given year, you can only apply for one of those. You cannot apply for everything. The way in New Mexico, you know, a lot of us are just applying like for every single species, whatever, give me an Oryx tag or Ibex or elk or, You've got to dial it in and say, okay, I want to, I want to try for a moose tag. And so right there, a ton of, a ton of the competition is already going elsewhere because they want to hunt for bighorn sheep or mountain goat. So another thing about Idaho is there's no preference point system. So I applied for this once in a lifetime moose tag in 2015 and 2016, and I drew it in 2017. I applied for three years. There was none of this building up 25 bonus points and point creep and all that malarkey. Um, on the downside, there's a bunch of, you know, you gotta buy your license to, to apply. There's a bunch of credit card fees that you have to pay 
that you don't get back. And the credit card fees are based on a percentage of the cost of the license. And as you might expect, a once in a lifetime moose tag is an expensive license. It's about $2,100. And so you pay a percentage of that and you don't get any of that money back. So, you know, you're, you, there's, there's pros and cons, but the coolest thing about Idaho is the fact that they force you to divide up all that application competition. So one of the things I want to point out in this table that surprised me when I started digging into this information more, more deeply, if you look at these columns, you can see the percent of residents who drew in these different units, and you can see the percent of residents who drew in these different units. And most of the time, like in this example, this hunt 3302, the odds of a resident drawing that hunt were 50%, which is higher than the odds of a non-resident drawing that hunt. But as you start working through this table, you will see there are a lot of hunts in here where the non-resident odds of drawing the tag are significantly higher than the odds of a resident drawing that same hunt. So if you start doing your research on this table, and by the way, in New Mexico, some of the best <laughs> hunts are just like this. As an example, I will say, you know, the Sandia Mountains turkey hunt, that archery only turkey tag in the Sandias is like 10 times easier for a non-resident to draw than a resident, even though you have a much smaller pool of tags. So you can see there's only, for most of these hunts, there's like one non-resident tag for the whole hunt, right? But you have a very small number of people applying. So you have this universe of people who want to moose hunt and it gets winnowed down because some of those people are putting in for sheep or mountain goats. And then there's a billion different units. And so that spreads the competition out even more. So as you start looking through this, you'll see units where your odds, like uh, here's one, there was a single tag and a non-resident took it. Um, scrolling down. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of examples. Here's one where this unit, if you're a resident, you had a 6% chance of pulling it, even though there were four tags. But if you were a non-resident, you had a 10% chance. So starting to study the data, okay? So I, I, I won't belabor this any further, but you got to do your homework and start looking. So what are the factors that you're going to care about as you're evaluating these different units? In my mind, I was like, I want to go to a unit where I think I can get a moose. Like, what's the, what's the success rate, right? And so can you guys now see uh, harvest statistics success rates here? Getting that? Okay. So these are those same hunt codes. So you have to kind of cross-reference, go back and forth between these spreadsheets. But you can see they've got a column here that tells you for this year, for 2019, what was the success rate? And then you can see over here, they, you are required if you shoot a bull, you have to present it for registration. And they measure the outside spread of every bull that's legally harvested in the state of Idaho. And so they give you an, an average antler spread of all the bulls that were shot out of that unit. And what you'll see as you go through these data is that there are some units that have really big spreads of antlers and they're really hard to draw. There are other units that have really high success rates, maybe not as big of antlers, but they're also easier to draw. So I was putting in for a unit where the success rate was almost 100% every year the bulls were not as big, which is not the thing I cared most about. I was most interested in being able to go hunt a moose someday, preferably with my bow. And so those two variables of easy to draw and high success rate, that was the filter. And I was applying for a unit that I had never seen in real life, right? And again, three years and I drew it. So I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions about the drawing odds or these harvest statistics? People good? People tracking? I'm going to switch back over to my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay.
<laughs> All right. So you, you're lucky enough to finally draw the tag. What next? Um, part of it is figuring out where you want to camp, where you're going to hunt. And for me, the first thing I wanted to do was talk to the biologists who managed that unit. And that included biologists with the State Game and Fish Agency and also with the Forest Service. So I was contacting my colleagues up there who worked on the Idaho Panhandle National Forests, got a good idea of what part of the unit I wanted to focus on because, you know, all these game management units are overwhelming in terms of their size. And one of the things I was told was to focus on clear cuts of a certain age. You know, this is a landscape where timber production is a big deal. And those moose love hanging out in clear cuts that are about 15 to 20 years old. They're loaded with ceanothus and uh, maple and a host of, of uh, browse species that the moose really like. I also got some tips on where to camp. So traveled up there, got camp set up, and this tag that I drew was, uh, it was in any, any weapon tag, so you could use archery, muzzle loader, rifle, handgun, um, and it went from September all the way through December. And in the interest of maintaining my marriage, I knew I could not hunt from September until December for my once in a lifetime moose. So I had to figure out a time frame of like a week and a half or two weeks that would be the best possible time. And after talking to the biologists up there, I wanted obviously to try to correspond my hunt with when the rut was starting to peak for, uh, for the moose. And that was around the end of September. Another variable that came into play is that I had this long hunt. There were five tags available for. There was another batch of five tags with a shorter hunt season that started October 1st. So I decided to go up several days before the other hunt opened so that I'd have half the hunter density, albeit a total of five of us in this unit, and uh, spend a few days hunting with fewer people. So I went up at the end of September, which was also prime time from the standpoint of the biology of the species. Had been studying all these different maps of land ownership, um, where the public was, where the private was, road access with the motor vehicle use maps, um, pouring over satellite imagery. Um, I had all these ideas on my, on my computer. You know, I've been looking at Google Earth imagery of where these clear cuts were had all these waypoints preloaded onto my GPS. And then also the guy you're looking at on the screen right there, his name's Scott Peckham. He's a biologist for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation up in Oregon. He and I went to grad school together. Um, I recruited three of my most capable hunting buddies to join me on this trip. And the nice thing about that was with the four of us there, we could totally divide and conquer and and we did a lot of poking around individually trying to get a sense of where the best looking habitat was um you know if we were seeing moose or moose sign and then we could come back and compare notes at the end of the day and it didn't take us long to find this one clear cut where we spent almost the entirety of the hunt and from this one vantage point every time we were there we found at least cows, and we saw a number of different bulls out in this clear cut. And you can see in the distance there the edge of where um, that last cut had happened. And in the distance, there's another clear cut. So this is that classic like checkerboard, Northern Rockies kind of uh, timber management where a lot of that, a lot of that country is getting cut over and then left to regenerate and cut over again. But knowing from the biologists what habitat features some suggestions on areas we could try out made a big difference. And here's another, another shot at this same clear cut from a different vantage point. So really stark edges um, to where that, that uh, one square mile polygon existed. And we spent a lot of time just sitting up high, glassing. And then one of the cool things about being out in moose country during the rut is hearing the calling. And so we had cows that we could hear bellowing in the distance and also the bull moose making this like glunking sound that uh i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna try to imitate a little bit here because i've got my my moose call next to me so i'm gonna i'm gonna share a little bit of video footage with you guys and jesse and i were testing this out earlier today 
and the audio is not going to come through very well on on this program on zoom so i'm not going to spend a ton of time showing you footage without audio but jesse's going to post the link to the full video if anybody wants to see there's about 35 minutes of calling these moose getting them into pretty close range um getting them getting a shot at the moose with my bow all that stuff i'll share some of it with you right now but throughout the video you'll see this call right here and anybody who's going to be moose hunting i would strongly suggest picking one of these up it's called the, the bull magnet and uh they're, they're one of my sponsors who don't pay me anything but I, I talk about their product so the bull magnet is this piece of fiberglass it's like indestructible so the two ways you use this are calling through it and then scraping it on branches and it sounds a lot like an antler because it's kind of hard and hollow and so if you decide to watch that video you'll hear me scraping trees with this thing um, and it, I was impressed by how antler like it sounds so the other thing you can do with it that is pretty cool and didn't dawn on me initially is if you think you're hearing a call and sometimes these moose especially the bulls it's at such a low frequency it's hard to place the direction and sometimes you'll think you're hearing it it's almost like when you when you have a turkey sneak up drumming and you're like what the hell noise is that where is it coming from the moose glunking can be like that so if you use this thing as a hearing aid and kind of point it around you can get really good directional idea of where the glunking is coming from and there are a few times where you know, my friends and I would be like, God, I think I heard one. And you'd put this up and it was just like plain as day that you were hearing a bull glunking. So the other thing I'll add, you know, when it comes to hunting in general, and this is something Joe and I have been talking about these last couple of days via our text messages, I enjoy trying to figure this stuff out for myself, right? Like, do you want to, do you want to hire somebody to go out there and call for you? Um, do you want to like rely on somebody else? And for me, like, I don't ever plan on being the best moose caller, but I wanted to be sufficiently capable of calling a moose that I could say I called my own moose in. So I was, I was digesting YouTube moose calling video like a maniac for months leading up to this trip. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you a couple calls right now, but just know that I'm not like the most legit moose caller. So the females... The way I like to think about this is just imagining like the most lonely, uh, heart struck female moose you could possibly imagine. And she just wants a boyfriend worse than anything. And so they do this big bellow and I would plug my nostrils and give them something like this. like that so you've already passed out that's a couple of breaths all right and then the bulls the way the way that i heard it on the videos is this like oh uh, oh uh, sound so you're kind of going oh 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 and in real life when i heard these moose calling the best noise i can i can describe it as is like a, a glunk like g-l-u-n-k and it's almost a swallowing sound. So I got more of a lesson when I was out listening to the real moose and then just trying to imitate what they were doing. Kind of like learning how to turkey call, just imitating what the hens do. But those bulls, um, the sound can carry in a way that defies your belief. So for example, in this picture right here, can you guys see my cursor right now? Okay, so we had a bull walk out of this tall, forest here and come right down out of this stuff calling and it's almost a mile away and every one of those glunks I was like I'm hearing I'm hearing glunk and I'm sitting there with my binoculars scanning and I put my binoculars down and like plain as day I can see that bull you know jet black walking out along the edge of that clearing and when I got my binoculars back on him every time he glunk I could see his throat making that making that glunking noise and uh it's almost like the sound taps you in the chest Got my daughter coming up to say hi. Did you hear my calling? So the bulls, again, it's like, and if you want to make it carry more, you can go, and then rake this thing against the trees. 
And, you know, like to me, <laughs> there's nothing more exciting, whether it's calling for elk or calling for turkeys or calling for moose. But that moment when you, when you realize you've actually got one coming your way and, you know, like the gobbles are getting closer or the bugles are getting closer. But the thing about moose that was so different is if you look at this landscape and how thick it is, and you imagine an animal that's like 800 pounds with antlers at the front end plowing through that, the sound of just stuff breaking with every step the moose takes, and then that glunking, like that will, that will get you excited and super fired up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to bring up just a couple little video clips here from that trip. And Jesse told me he'd be able to, uh, to post that link. So if you wanna come back and check it out, there's some cool audio. It's a little bit faint because I was, I was recording this on a combination of a cell phone and uh, a GoPro that was inside of a case. So the audio is not super great, but you can hear uh, examples of that glunking and the, the bellowing. Um, so check that video out if you want to geek out on that a little bit more. So I'm going to shift over to YouTube and share a couple little segments. Stand by. Let's see. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, you want to come up and get everybody to be able to see you. Really? Yeah. You want to be here? Say hi, everybody. Come here. Got your giraffe with you. All right. Share screen. All right. So this is the edge of that same clear cut. Like basically the picture that I showed you a minute ago where I talked about that, that bull stepping out from the tall trees. This is just a little bit farther down that same slope. And so we had been calling um, down into this canyon and we heard a couple different bulls in there calling back and forth to each other and also calling to us. And when this was being shot, we could just hear, you know, branches breaking and stuff getting closer and closer to us. So you can see this video is 36 minutes. I'm not gonna subject you to all of that without good audio right now, but I'll just try to take you through a couple of the cool highlights and I'll narrate uh, what's going on. So. Again, in the distance, you can just get a sense of the habitat, that clear cut, a lot of maple, um, a lot of ceanothus, a lot of spruce trees. Um, and those, those moose were just hanging right down in the bottom of this and we were trying to call them up out. So you'll see that call, the one I was just playing around with, making some of those glunks or doing, doing my best impression of it. And I would add, so on this trip, you know, it's a once in a lifetime tag. And I mentioned that it was in any weapon hunt. And my, my plan of attack here was I really wanted to try to get one with my bow, but I also really wanted to get one. So my, my plan was that I was gonna bow hunt for the first week. And if I just struck out um, with archery equipment after the first week, I was gonna shift gears and try to get one with the rifle. And this first, first encounter that I had had this bull come up and he was at about 80 yards you'll see in a moment here just raking the heck out of a out of a maple sapling and shaking it all over and you know he's broadside from me at 80 yards and I was thinking god I wonder if this is the moment that I'm gonna regret not just taking my rifle after a moose um, but I stuck with it for the first few days with the bow and that was what ended up happening so I'm gonna scan forward here a little bit in the video and see if I can get to some of the visualization of the moose. Let's see. See if that loads. Okay, so this is the moose right here. He just he actually just bedded down right there. See his antlers sticking up. I'll try to go back a little bit more because there's some cool footage of him giving that tree a hard time. You'll see him in a second. So he's right here in this little clearing. And there's a moment where if you decide to watch this with, with the audio um, separate from my presentation, 
when I call to this moose, he's glunking back and getting increasingly angry. And then it seemed like uh, he just couldn't handle it anymore and, and ultimately goes over to this shrub and gives it a good ripping. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. You see him in there raking those trees? Yeah. So he ended up bedding down there for a little while and we had cows bellowing around there too. You'll see his back legs shift around here and then he plops down right there next to that. A little sapling. So this is the same moose that I ended up the next day calling in even closer. And so I'll forward, fast forward to that scenario. Um, so again, a familiar, a familiar clear cut here. And uh, that's that same tree line in the distance that we were talking about where the, the one came out glunking a couple days before. So I can hear all kinds of activity down this slope and just being able to see through that country is half the battle because it's so thick. But it sounded like this moose was super close. So at one point I stood up on this stump here to try to get a better vantage point. And I could see the back of the moose angling up slope. And I kind of got a sense of the trajectory that the moose was on, but he didn't come in initially. So I skirted around and got on his trail, which was very easy to identify in the moist, soft sand, and uh, basically tracked the moose down into a thicket where he'd stopped. It was only about maybe 100 yards from where I had been calling. So yeah, so there you can see the call, using it like the antler rake in the bushes. And that moose below me was glunking like crazy at that point. So I'm going to fast forward here and show you the um, the trail that I cut. It's right about there. Yeah, so see that, that big track? These are all fresh tracks from where that bull had just come through. So I followed these tracks for maybe about 50 yards and then spotted the bull in this thicket. And uh, let's see. And this is the, the distance of the encounter I had with him at that point. So that bull you know, it's difficult to tell, but he's about 20 yards away. And when he turned to walk up slope, I grunted at him just with my voice. And he stopped in a nice little shooting lane at about 20 yards, perfectly broadside. And then turned from there and ran down out of sight, down slope. And then we've got some footage in here from coming back that night with my friends. And the bull was about 75 yards from where I'd taken the shot. And so we spent a good chunk of our night there, obviously dealing with the meat, dealing with um, a lot of hiking back and forth between that old logging road and the, the truck up, up the slope from where we were.
that's the moose that I got with my bow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's. So you just lost him there? Yep. That, well, that's where he fell over. And you didn't know he fell over? I knew he fell over, but we had to go find him. Oh. My daughter's got some good questions. So yeah, Jesse, Jesse can share this uh, this video with y'all. It's kind of it's kind of uh, compromised a little bit by not having any audio. I apologize for that, but gives you an idea of the size of these things. Like this was a, you know, for the unit a nice size moose, um, and when you see him laying there, you know, like the size of the body almost makes the the size of the antlers seem small. And I've got a picture in my presentation of when we got him into my my truck. And just the scale is all hard to comprehend if you're a Midwestern boy who grew up hunting white-tailed deer. They're, they're big animals. And of course, the Shiras is the smallest of the four subspecies as well. So as moose go, they're little, but as ungulates go, they're, they're big. So I'm gonna shift back over to my presentation here. Well, there's, there's a picture you can see that gives you an idea of kind of the scale of that awesome critter. And food-wise, man, they're just fantastic to eat. So we'll talk a little bit about meat here in a moment, too. So I'm going to shift back over now. Okay. What are you doing, bud? Okay, so now I've got some pictures from recovering that moose. And you can see it kind of fell, this is in that old clear cut and it was handy to be able to access this old logging road where the moose had fallen because trying to work in that thick stuff would have just been a nightmare. Um, but still we spent a lot of that night dealing with some heavy loads. Um, this next picture is my buddy Sam standing next to that moose gives you an idea of, again, the scale. And, you know, body weight wise, a, a, a shiris would be similar to like a, a good size bull elk. So you're talking seven, 800 pounds in that range on the hoof, but they're also, they're way taller. So when they're, when they're coming through that country that all that, all that mass is up a little bit higher off the ground and it gives, gives you the sense that they're bigger than they actually are, I think on the hoof when you're used to looking at elk, for example. So here's my buds. And again, I would just say, like, the, the key criteria here were, were friends who wanted to share in the experience. We're, we're gonna be um, capable of going out and kind of covering ground and helping me figure out in an area I'd never hunted before. You know, you're kind of violating the golden rule by not getting up there and scouting in advance of your hunt. So to show up and think, you're going to have a great hunt having never laid eyes on the place. It made a lot of sense to have some friends who knew, knew how to, you know, find sign and read the land and could cover ground. And then of course, when it came to hauling out all that meat, it was helpful to have some able-bodied uh, assistance. Not that you couldn't do it alone if you had to. There's a, Another picture of the guy, and then the last load out was hauling that, hauling that head. And I mentioned again that idea of scale. So here's the here's a Toyota Tacoma, you know, with the <laughs> the antlers from a smaller Shiras bull that pretty much fill up the tailgate. And we were calling this bull the Spike Bull because we'd seen a couple different, a um, couple different bulls in there. And this guy, you know, for the brow tines, he just had these big single kind of daggery looking brow tines that made them very easy to differentiate. So in terms of the load that we hauled out, this was our meat tree back at camp. Um, I never had a scale to uh, evaluate the total mass, but you know, I've shot a handful of bull elk and I think this probably edged out meat wise. Any of the elk I've, I've taken 
Um, and again, like quality meat was awesome. So we had this wall tent set up as our processing spot with a bunch of easily washable tables in there. We could keep the meat dry. You know, it's a really wet piece of country up there in the Idaho panhandle. So being able to work out of the rain and uh, keep the moisture off the meat was a big deal. Um, we did a bunch of Flintstone style rib packages that we've all divvied up and long since consumed. Uh, but yeah, it took the better part of the next day to get all this meat trimmed up. Um, and we had a ton of ice on hand as well. So what we were doing was getting things fairly well cleaned up into big basic cuts and then uh, throwing them in Ziploc bags and putting them on ice right off the bat. So there's an idea scale of one of the hind quarters. And when we got done with that first day of cutting, this is what we had uh, to share four ways amongst my buddies and, and me. So pretty good haul of meat. Of course, we did the uh, mandatory camp feast of some tenderloin and eggs and salsa. And then because all of us had planned, you know, basically like a week or more to be up there, and I shot that bull on, I believe it was day four of the trip. Um, we had to entertain ourselves otherwise. So we shifted gears into small game mode, did some rough grouse hunting in the woods around there. And then also we were hunting around a bunch of tributaries to uh, the Clearwater River. And so great cutthroat trout fishing and also habitat for bull trout. So we were able to do a little fly fishing, catch some bull trout. And then while we were up there, you know, again, thinking about the timing of our hunt, it started shifting quickly into winter mode while we were there. So I felt like we timed our trip very well. And uh, had we stayed a whole lot longer, I would have started to get nervous about the condition of the roads because we were pretty far off the beaten path. I think I hear, let me hear. So, those are some uh, those are some highlights from my my once in a lifetime Idaho panhandle, panhandle moose hunt. And I hope um, if any of you are are interested in trying to pursue one of these tags, um, and you're lucky enough to pull one, I would I would not only loan you my my moose call, but I would also be more than happy to talk uh, about planning strategy, et cetera, in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting. So I'm giving you my personal email account there and uh, would welcome the opportunity to brainstorm with you. Or if you're starting to look at those stats, um, I know the, the application deadline for 2020 has already passed. It was April 30th. But if you're looking towards 2021, you know, it's never too early to start doing your research. So I will, uh, I will pause there and see if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask about anything I've shared. I wasn't there earlier. What did that tag cost? So that tag, you know, you have to buy the hunting license before you apply. And I think in Idaho, it's like 100 and, I don't know, 160 bucks or something like that, that you don't get back, whether you, whether you draw or not. And the tag itself, I believe was 2100. So and it took you three years? Three, th yeah, three years to draw it. And of course, you know, the way, the way Idaho does it, you have to pay up front for the tag. The thing that's super obnoxious about what Idaho does, and some other states do it too, but um, there's a credit card processing fee. And I think in Idaho, it's a 3% of your uh, total transaction to go to the credit card processing fee. So you're paying 3% of $2,100. 60 bucks. If you don't get drawn, they give you back your 2100 but you're out the hunting license fee and you're out these obnoxious credit card fees and there's no cash or check option. So you're kind of on the hook for that. But yes, yeah, you know, it's a very pricey tag. Um, the way I justify it to myself and also to my wife who's like, wait, how much is that moose tag? You know, like this is for me, there's, there's, um, there's no, like I, I hesitate to even use the word hobby because it's not really a hobby to me. Like this is the thing I enjoy doing most of all outside of spending time, you know, with my own family. 
being out in the woods hunting and to have a once in a lifetime opportunity at an animal like a Shiris moose, um, where literally, you know, you might, you might do that maybe once, maybe not at all. If you're super lucky, maybe you hunt in a couple different states over the course of your life. Um, I'm not out there like buying uh, super fancy motorcycles or uh, a new bass boat. I've got a crappy old rowboat and I'm happy to pay, you know, a couple thousand bucks for an experience like that, knowing that that money's going to go to the state game and fish agency. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if you look at the value of that experience shared with those people, um, I would have probably been willing to pay more than that for that tag, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's a lot less than Alaska. Yeah. Yeah. So Alaska, you know, Alaska is interesting because you can, you can obviously go up to Alaska and just buy a moose tag and go moose hunting over the counter any year. Mm -hmm. um, the killer are the logistics. I mean, the best moose hunting you can access in Alaska is going to be off the beaten path. So you're talking about probably flying in somewhere, which is very expensive. And then just the process of getting your meat home can be super expensive too, let alone hiring an outfitter, a guide, all that sort of stuff. So even if you've got somebody up there who's willing to take you, you're going to spend a couple thousand bucks on the logistics. And for this trip, I was able to, you know, just road trip up from New Mexico, meet my friends up there. Um, I actually had one of those guys came down from Alaska to hunt with me, another guy from Arizona, and then a guy from uh, Oregon. So we all met there and we all had coolers and split it up. My guy from Alaska took relatively less meat because <laughs> he was going to be getting on a plane. Um, but the ability to have all my gear, um, all the coolers, all that stuff just in the back of my truck and road trip made it super convenient. So, you know, if you're going to hunt moose, it's going to be a pretty expensive proposition. And, you know, for, for most of us of modest means, it's not going to be something you're able to do every single year. Um, and if you want to be able to hunt moose in the lower 48, it's got to be this combination of luck and spending, spending some loot. And the reality is if you're lucky enough to get the tag, your chances of getting the moose are going to be pretty high, you know, in that 80% range throughout the subspecies range. Other questions? Hey, Carl. Yeah, Carl, I got a question for you. Well, it's not a question. It's, it's more of a uh, solve the impossible question type of thing. I was so glad when you were going through the moose population information and showing the the, the current trends in moose populations and obviously there's some states that are declining. It was fantastic that you showed those parasites. You mentioned some of the climate change issues. Obviously predation is a is a big issue. I would hazard a guess, completely um, wild ass guess right here, but if you asked 90% of the hunters out there, why are moose populations in Wyoming and Montana and in Idaho declining, you know what their answer is going to be. It's going to be wolves. Yeah. How, how do we how do we educate our our, our masses, the the hunters? There's one thing that I'm just finding more and more. They're they're, they're following the the popular. Um, I, I don't even want to say magazine articles. They're following social media is what they're following. So how do we how do we change that? <laughs> All right, you're on. <laughs> well, I think, you know, so part of it is acknowledging that that is a piece of the puzzle, right? right. But, so it's not, it's not trying to argue that predation isn't part of it. But I think if you look at the, you know, the kind of macro time scale and think about moose as a relic of the Pleistocene and wolves having cohabitated with moose on the landscape for thousands of years, you know, that, that dynamic hasn't changed. A lot of other things have changed. And so when we start looking at issues of habitat connectivity, we start looking at issues of habitat quality, when we start looking at um, habitat loss through human development, um, when we start looking at the impacts of a changing climate driven by human causes, those are variables that, um, have changed dramatically since you know 200 years ago so i think you know you're you're, just, you're not going to convince everybody that 
even science has value. You know, I, I feel like in some circles, there's almost even an anti, an element of anti-science at play. So talking about the peer reviewed journal articles and talking about data, you know, there's, there's only, that's only going to get you so far. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I mean, just to be frank, I feel like there are, there's an element of the, Baby. of the hunting community sure. that is okay. so entrenched in their um, sort of echo chamber and ideology that they're not going to be convinced out of it. And I, it, it, that, that makes me sad to say, um, but I think it's true. And one of the things that, you know, as I was hunting in that landscape and as we were encountering moose sign in that lands, uh, moose and wolf sign in that landscape, because the Idaho Panhandle has very robust wolf populations, you know, I was thinking to myself, this experience of being in this landscape is so much cooler with this full complement of other predators on the landscape, mountain lions, wolves, knowing that you're within sufficient proximity of occupied grizzly bear habitat that it's not beyond the realm of possibility to even be sharing the landscape with the grizzly bear, black bear sign everywhere. You know, like to me, the experience of, of hunting an animal like a Shiris moose would be compromised if I were in a place that were artificially suppressed in terms of the suite of predators. But I recognize that that is not reflective of the full uh, team of the hunting community. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I feel like I have as much or more in common with somebody who's a big fan of wolves and not really into hunting than I am somebody who thinks wolves are the answer or the problem or you know the solution potentially um, and identifies as a hunter. Because it's complicated, man. You look at that table and you see there are, there are X number of parasites at play. There are all these issues with habitat change. There are these issues with the changing climate. There's predation layered on top of that. This is not like a simple system. This is a super complex system. But what's for sure is that these species have been interacting with each other for thousands of years. And the thing that has changed is not the fact that wolves are eating moose or that grizzly bears are eating moose because that's the way it's been for a long dang time. But my, my, like my patience for, that, for those kind of debates where it's just like a black and white thing and, and you're, you're interacting with someone who is so entrenched in their mindset that they can't even hear what you want to say like I, as as I maybe it's as I'm getting a little bit a little bit older, like my my tolerance for those kind of discussions has just dwindled. Maybe no, maybe I, I'm I, not a great person for that, but that's that's the way I feel. I, I think you nailed it, and it was actually in, it, it's a quote that I I absolutely love, and it was actually born out of this this whole COVID situation. But I think it's so prophetic. In the one article, it said, um, "You have to understand people nowadays." They don't want to be educated. They want to be lied to. Um, most people don't really want the, their beliefs changed. They simply want them reaffirmed. And so whenever, when, whenever they have a belief, they take this tiniest shred of evidence to say, aha, see, I told you so. So yeah, it, it's, it's an uphill battle, but I think just continuing the work of the Federation and all these other environmental groups trying to put out the, the, the science for people to grasp, I think that's, I, that's our road to hoe, so to speak. I, I like that. I, one of the things I would say in response to that is I feel like it's not even necessarily about getting the science out. I think, I think all of us have a fundamental responsibility, whether we're talking about issues around hunting and conservation or issues around whatever polarizing topic we might be wrestling with as a, as a society or even as a subset, as a small group of friends. Um, having the desire to actually try to understand somebody else's point of view and listen and, and have an appetite for challenging your own preconceptions. That is something that the value of that cannot be overstated. And, you know, I, I very sincerely appreciate 
the New Mexico Wildlife Federation inviting me to give a talk like this. And I, you know, I love what you all do. And I, I love you as individual people. You're an awesome group and I admire you. But one of the things that stands out about this organization, and, and it's not the only one, but it's one of the first that comes to my mind is a thoughtful approach to these conversations, right? It's like, when, when I think about the leadership and the membership, the faces I see on the screen right now, like these are, these are men and women who genuinely care about the resource and genuinely respect other human beings, you know, and, and want to have thoughtful discussions. And I think all of us have our own strong opinions about things, but there's a willingness in this, in this community to want to, seek understanding of people who might have a different perspective and if we want to think about conservation and hunting as like this one little piece of a much bigger set of issues that we face as a society the way to break those barriers down is to have an appetite for putting yourself in other people's perspective and i think it's a minority of our you know, of our in-group of the hunting community that actually genuinely wants to proactively seek those other perspectives and try to understand them. And I think that's unfortunate, but that's one of the reasons when, you know, when, when Jesse or, or Ben or anybody from this group says, Hey man, would you be willing to do A, B, or C? I'm always like, yes, I'll raise my hand for that because that, that ethos I just described and, and Daryl, you put it well with the COVID example like that's the missing ingredient and that's the reason we're getting our butts handed to us as a conservation community too by the way because everybody wants to be in their little comfortable echo chamber and as a result it's divided we fall those are really good points carl um, and thank you very much for all the kind words and for your participation and your willingness to every time whether it's speaking at the capitol building or at one of our live events or using you as a reference for a grant that we're writing, whatever it is, you're just incredibly supportive and, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, I got a question earlier from Brandon that I, that I thought was interesting. This is in the chat room. I'm going to go back to it so I can read it. Uh, Brandon asked if there were any antler size restrictions you had to watch out for during your hunt. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had to shoot a, I had to shoot an antlered bull and I believe, I mean, it was, it was, really straightforward I think it was a six inch um, definition like anything with an antler over six inches and so we saw several several different bowls where you know like this one I think this one had if I remember right it was like a 37 inch spread on that bowl when they measured it the conservation officer by the way is the only one who put a tape measure on my bowl um, I think it was 37 inches and every bowl we saw it was like that's definitely a legal bull, you know? It wasn't, one of the challenges, and, and I think that's a really good question, because one of the challenges with some of those over-the-counter hunts up in Alaska, for example, a lot of those units will have a 50-inch minimum. Yeah. And it'll be like 50 inches, help me out, it's 50 inches or four brow tines on a side, oops, split four. Yeah, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Uh, I was with JP in Alaska. We were on a gravel bar in the middle of a river. We had a bull elk, I mean, a bull moose about, 30 yards away that I have the opportunity to shoot and JP's telling me shoot it and I asked JP I said is it 50 inches he says yeah it's 50 inches take it I said are you sure it's 50 inches he said yeah it is and I said well how wide is it he says exactly 50 inches I said well what do you mean exactly 50 inches JP he's like it's exactly 50 inches and so needless to say uh we didn't shoot that, that moose nor did we shoot any other moose on the trip but um I totally know what you're talking about when you're referring to that 50 inch antler restriction. I still have nightmares about that. Yeah, well, the perfect, perfect situation is if you have one that's got the clearly identifiable four brow tines. But to be out there trying to guesstimate, you know, and they've got all these tricks like the distance between the eyes and the length of the ear, and, you know, and, and you're out there wondering, um, that would be extremely stressful. So when I was up there, it was like, I believe it was a six inch antler was good to go and so we didn't see a single bull where that we were scratching our heads on it and you know I also um, obviously was not super picky when I had a good opportunity with my bow at a broadside 
bull at 20 yards, um, there was not any part of my head that was like, well, you know, maybe there's a bigger one over the next hill. I was like, this is a good chance for a nice clean shot with a bow and arrow on a moose. I'm taking it. And I have not had, you know, any <laughs> second thoughts or regrets since then. It all went perfectly, you know, to be able to recover the animal quickly, all that stuff. I was, um, to be honest with you, I was, I was most concerned about a scenario where I made a bad shot with my bow and then was thinking to myself, why the hell did I make this an archery hunt when it could have been a rifle hunt? And the answer is I love bow hunting, right? And, and I knew I could make a good shot if I was selective and all that, but that was the thing I was worrying about in advance. Like that would be the worst possible scenario would be to wound one with a bow and then be kicking myself thinking it would have been, you know, a slam dunk with a rifle kind of thing. So that was one of the reasons I was really selective about the shot opportunity as we always should be, but also just thinking about the size of that animal and, you know, a little hundred grain broadhead being the, the key to success. Um, Jeremy Romero asked a question earlier, but, but I think I could probably answer it for you, Carl, not to put words in your mouth, but Jeremy asked how many trips to the chiropractor were needed after packing out that moose. But uh, based on our conversations, I think you carry his backpack often enough for him during the fall and you're probably in pretty good shape <laughs> that's my thought oh man <laughs> yeah i uh one thing i'll say on that front um so we all got out of there without any kind of injuries um at all to speak of with uh with that moose and i think having the help of my buddies made a big difference there um but i i did a turkey hunt this spring like way off the beaten path and hauled out a heavy pack plus two gobblers <laughs> And my uh, my Achilles tendon on my right heel has not been the same since that hike out. <laughs> so I'm hoping that gets better. But you got to you definitely have to take care of yourself when you're hauling heavy loads a long ways for sure and take breaks. So hoping I can be back to 100 percent in time for my my elk packing adventure this fall. <laughs> Romero's pretty um, strong. He's always carrying out those big heavy antlers, so he's he's keeping in shape. <laughs> Uh, ben, ben asked a question. Uh, he says he'd like to hear more about the meat processing. He continues, it seems you didn't have the opportunity to hang the meat very long. Was that ideal? Also, do you have any thoughts about bagging the meat as opposed to wrapping it in paper? Did you rewrap it later? Yeah, so my goal there, I wanted to, I wanted to keep the meat dry first and foremost. The biggest enemy we had to contend with there was the rain. Um, and so that was one of the reasons we had that wall tent set up to be our little packing station. I think in terms of hanging the meat, it would have been nice to do that. Um, the reality is we were eating that moose like up until early this year, we've been eating that moose for three years. And I think as a substitute to hanging meat um, after it's taken and before it's packed, I think when it's, when it's stored frozen, as long as you don't have a lot of fat on it, some of that, some of that breakdown, some of that tenderization can happen over time, even in the freezer, if it's well packaged. And I took everything out of the plastic bags when I got home and back sealed all that meat because I knew getting through that much was going to take a long, a long time. And we also had some other critters in the freezer still at that point. So the meat was definitely um, repackaged at home. In terms of paper versus plastic, like I, I would never just take plastic bags of meat and freeze them like that. Um, I'm a big fan of vacuum sealing everything. Um, I've done a lot of paper wrapping in the past. It's great if you're not going to store it for a long time. But, you know, I've, I've pulled some of those moose packages out. It would have been, you know, literally two and a half years after shooting that animal and uh, with properly vac sealed bags that meat's been excellent baseball players so, so is there a follow up there maybe somebody's not on mute so the other thing i'd say ben um i mentioned the idea of just kind of like a quick and dirty breakdown of those of those chunks of meat you know as i have gone from being predominantly a white-tailed deer hunter in the midwest to getting into more of the elk hunting here and and with this moose the idea of handling an animal that size and trying to do all the all the neat and pretty work of you know cleaning up all the fascia and 
getting all my all my steaks cut and all my roasts nicely trimmed and all my burger ground and packaged on a whole animal that size. I've just totally quit doing that. And I've gotten into the habit now of basically <clears throat> packaging big chunks of roast, like big muscle groups. And then what I'll do is we jar a lot of meat. We can can a lot of ground meat. So we'll pull it out in batches and we'll can like maybe three to five gallons of canned meat at a time for our ground. That frees up a lot of space in the freezer. And then if I want to have fresh burger, I'll pull out certain cuts, certain roasts and grind for burger or sausages. And I'll do the same thing if I want to cut steaks. So I, I basically am trying to get meat off bone, as much fat removed as possible, not trying to make it look pretty or perfect, getting it cold, getting it vac sealed, getting it frozen. And then I do a lot of work with individual packages. So my wife will say like, I wanna make a, a pot roast and I'll pull out a package and spend a lot of time getting it looking all perfect. And that'll be like, you know, five months after I've shot whatever animal it is and I'm all fresh and my back doesn't hurt. And I'll, I'll spend time like with precision instruments just making like the most beautiful little pot roast you ever saw, but not trying to do that on the scale of the whole animal. So if you look in my freezer right now, you'll just see a bunch of packages that are labeled with the species, the year, what part of the animal it is, and then it's just like big chunks of meat that needs some cleanup work done on them. So that's the habit I've gotten into. I, I, I've got friends that are like meticulous and they'll spend, you know, two sleepless nights getting everything perfect and beautiful. And I think they're maniacs, but there's, it's a matter of preference. Uh, hey, Carl, to follow up on, on that question, um, not specific to this particular hunt that you were on, but have you ever used citric acid to help with meat preservation as you're trying to get it out of the field? Because when John Pierce and I shared that moose hunt, um, you know, there was a strong likelihood that had we harvested a, a moose, we were going to be, it would take us a significant amount of time to get that animal out of the field. And so we had taken, if I recall correctly, uh, JP still on, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but we took some spray bottles and we took some dried citric acid powder and we had done some research on a way to, to turn that into a solution that would aid us in ensuring that we had proper meat care until we were able to get to a point where we could, uh, get that meat out of the field? <laughs> the short answer is no, I've not, I've not experimented with that at all. Um, my one, my one phrase, my, my one favorite uh, little trick that I don't think a lot of people are turned on to um, is the salted ice water bath where, and this would not be practical for the scenario you described, Jesse, where you're way off the hinterlands, but in really hot weather, um, one of the things I have come to, uh, basically do a standard procedure. So imagine pronghorn hunting in August and it's going to be hundred degrees. Um, I'll have coolers fill, full of, of ice, like cubes of ice and uh, a jug of water and then a bunch of non iodized salt. And basically it's the same, the same technique as if you're making old fashioned uh, ice cream, right? With like the ice cream churn. So you use the salt to lower the melting point of the, um, of the ice and you make this slurry of ice, water and salt and you can submerge quarters in that liquid and freeze them solid in a cooler in 100 degree weather. So it's really slick. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, it works really, really well. And, uh, and then when you pull, you know, when you pull those quarters out, you rinse them really well. You, uh, you actually go through a few cycles of changing the water. I'll keep a pronghorn in my driveway in salted ice bath for a week in hot weather and just keep changing out fresh water, fresh ice, a little bit of salt, cycle it through and then hang the quarters up, let them drip dry. And there'll be a little discolored kind of like uh, a very thin layer around the outside of the cut. But as soon as you cut into it, it's just like the most deep purple, beautiful, flavorful, awesome meat. And you, I've done it with elk with pronghorn, with mule deer. So not exactly what you're talking about, Jesse. I, I think the challenges when you're off the beaten path like that are, it's a whole different ball game for sure. But that salted ice bath trick is pretty dang slick if you're trying to cool off meat in hot weather. I've never heard of that. Works like a charm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anybody else heard of that? Is that like news to everybody? Well, think of me fondly next time you try it. <laughs> I do a similar process, but I've never used salt, so. Yeah, a little bit of salt, like it'll, I, I'm not kidding you. It will, it will be so cold in there that you cannot keep your hand in for 10 seconds. It, it, it is the ice, ice cold. I read, I read online, um, you can get it down to like 15 or 16 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't invent this. I, I found it on a, one of the forums, somebody talking about it. So I'm just trying to share the technology. But no, uh, powdered, powdered citric acid is one I've not, I've not uh, toyed around with, Jesse. So Daryl's asking to get unmuted. I'm thinking he must be muted himself because I don't think I've got him muted. What's going on there, Daryl? Try unmuting yourself. Okay. No, it, it was saying <laughs> the host muted me. Um, oh, I, I might if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, no, Carl, I was just going to say your white-tailed deer background is shining through because I think that whole ice water bath with salt water Everyone in the southeast does that. Um, right. we, we, we deal with 100 degree weather sometime. And so, yeah, that's, that's just a common trick in, in white-tailed deer habitat, so. It works great, right? Oh yeah, I, I use it all the time. In fact, j just so you know, my one and only elk I got up on the Jemez a couple of years ago, I didn't pack out until about three in the morning and I went to uh, Walmart to buy a kiddie pool uh, like 10 bags of ice and a bunch of iodized salt. And I just threw all the, the back legs, everything in the kiddie pool, iced it down. I, I just left it there for the next couple of days as I processed it. And um, I was thinking to myself, I'm probably the first one that ever bought a kiddie pool and ice at three in the morning from Walmart. But then I'm saying, yeah, I bet your fraternity boys have done this before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeremy pointed out it's a good way to cool off a beer real fast too. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine that's true. So you mentioned non-iodized, and then Daryl, you mentioned iodized. Does it make well, a it, big difference? I, just, <laughs> I don't think it really um, mattered too much. I was processing it over the next couple of days, so I just grabbed a couple of cans of. I, I don't even remember what I looked for. Just grabbing the big canisters of salt. No, I don't think it makes a big difference, chemically speaking. How much are you putting unless in? You're low on, unless you're low on your iodide consumption. <laughs> Could help you out. How much are you putting in like an ice chest, a, a, half, a half a pound or? So, you know, those cylinders, like yeah. what, are the, what are those weigh? I don't know, whatever those weigh. Right. Um, imagine a, uh, a cooler with, let's say, four bags of ice, four 10 pound bags of ice you'd sprinkle one of those cylinders over the top of that whole thing, add in the water, stir it around. That, that's and about my, perfect. Yeah, I told my friend, the, the guy that was in, in some of those hunting pictures up in Oregon, I told him about this. He's like, all right, I'm gonna try it, man. And I told him the same thing. I said, one of those cylinders for the, for the cooler, and somehow he got it crossed up in his mind that it was one of those cylinders for each bag of ice, which is like oh. four times as much. So he had a bunch of like pickled, Pickled up. <laughs> yeah, I I use two two cylinders for one kiddie pool, so whatever that equates. To. There you go. Any other questions? Well, Carl, uh, yeah. let me just tell you, uh, Joe's Joe's on with us here today, and Joe, uh, you mind if I tell him what you drew, Joe? I uh, yeah. Well, Carl and I had been texting about it already, but I. I drew uh, Wyoming uh, moose just this last weekend. So, man, uh, I've, that's awesome. I've, so I just want to say we'll be uh, we'll be doing a follow up one of these with you, Joe, after that hunt. <laughs> it should be great. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Let's hope. We'll keep, the, we'll keep the banter going by text message too, Joe, or, or chat on the phone anytime you want as well. Cool. I do have one other announcement while y'all think about uh, whatever questions might linger in your mind. So let me, uh, let me share my screen. Let's see. All right, the last announcement I have for you all. 
The next uh, New Mexico Wildlife Federation contest is going to be a storytelling contest. So tell your friends. There will be more, more coming on uh, social media in the days ahead. But they're looking for compelling, heartwarming, tragic, funny, whatever kind of stories you have that involve a first-time turkey hunter. It could be a first person account, a second person account, you name it, as long as it's a first time turkey hunter and it makes someone shed tears of joy or sadness or heartache. Uh, you've got from today through the end of the month to pull those stories together. First place prize is gonna get one of these handmade special limited edition New Mexico Wildlife Federation box calls made by Gary Roy Ball of Manzano Madness. There are also prizes for uh, turkey calls, hats, mugs, hunt to eat t-shirts, New Mexico Wildlife Federation shirt stickers, and much, much more. And the next, the next Wildlife Wednesday event will have the, uh, the winner of this first time turkey story contest announced. So share Quick that question. around when uh, you hear about it on Facebook or Instagram. Quick question, this is probably for Jesse. Does that story have to be from New Mexico? No, uh, not New Mexico specific. Ben also asked the question, do we have to have a turkey harvested? The answer is no. We just want to hear about um, first turkey hunting experiences in the field. Again, as Carl mentioned, whether it's your hunt or a hunt that you experience with somebody else. One of the things that we're working hard on, and um, this can get a little bit complicated, as many of you have seen this year, applications in the Mexico draw were up about 4,000 applicants applications at least, not about applicants, but 4,000 applications more this than we had last year. So nationally, as hunting, as, as, the, as hunting seems to be on the decline on a national level, in New Mexico, we're doing a really great job of it. But one of the things I, I, I'd like to highlight is the, the amount of opportunity we have in this state that does not require drawing a lottery tag. And earlier in the presentation, Carl did a thumbs up, thumbs down on how you feel about the draw. Uh, I was fortunate this year, but the last few years I've had really bad luck. But what we want to do is, is emphasize the fact that we can introduce people into this wonderful thing and into nature and into outdoor experiences with having to have drawn a tag in the lottery. So Turkey is one terrific example of, of how we can do that. So that's the reason we picked a Turkey. Also, it's timely given the, the time of year. Uh, Gay Roy Ball at Manzano Minus Game Calls makes incredible handmade calls. And he's currently um, making a, a call specific to the New Mexico Wildlife Federation. So uh, this should be a lot of fun. And just as a reminder, we are going to come out on social media with that tomorrow with all the details, um, all the formats that you can submit it in and who to send it to when you're done. Cool. Plug delivered, my friends. Any other uh, any other questions about moose or or conservation echo chambers or anything else under the sun? It's good seeing y'all. Jot down that email. Address. Um, I'll go back one slide. If anybody wants to. Uh, wants to drop me a line about about the uh, Idaho moose tag they draw next year. Happy to chat. And Joe, congrats on the, uh, the luck in the draw you've had. I'm looking forward to hearing about it, buddy. Hey, hey Carl, you'll get a kick out of this. If, if you saw me texting away, someone just sent me a photo because they had proof of <laughs> black panthers in the east. They sent me that. How many times yeah. have you seen that photo? <laughs> That's the like South it, African man. cat. I like it. Carl, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate all your support. Thanks, everybody who joined us this evening. Uh, hope everybody stays healthy, stays safe. Um, and hopefully pretty soon we're going to be able to Zoom at some point, uh, getting together in a nice social setting at the Marble Brewery again. Until yeah, then, we'll continue to try to get together virtually to the best of our ability. That's good seeing all your faces for sure. It's a nice infusion of some 
social life. <laughs> I miss you all. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.